we're talking about is finite state machines. Um, in a finite state machine, when we had those examples of the counters, we were moving between a state, and that's a simple finite state machine. There's only certain states it can be in, and that's it. It goes between them and does some tasks. Um, for doing the design process, there'll be this general, uh, these general steps we'll use, so I'll go through each of them with a bit of an example. So where we can use a finite state machine is basically anything that you can describe dependent on certain states. So everything we were doing before with combinational logic, we have these inputs, and based solely on those inputs, you generate an output. Um, a vending machine, for example, is a finite state machine. You can imagine that it has a sensor that says what type of coin you put in, um, here I'll simplify it, say it can only accept quarters and loonies. And depending on what coin you put in, the output might be different. Because if you've already put in a dollar and you put in that extra 25 cents, it then says, okay, you can get candy or whatever you want. Um, whereas if you just put in a quarter, it doesn't do anything initially because you now are at the 25 cent point. Um, so to design a state machine, again, step one, understand the problem, read the problem, think about it a bit. Um, so you can think that, okay, we have sensors for dollars and quarters. Um, we need to design some box here and assume that we have a dollar input or loony input, I think I'll call it, and a quarter input. Um, you can assume there's some sort of clock externally. We'll normally assume there's a clock and there is probably going to be a reset, we'll assume. So the reset starts it up in some specific state. Um, before, when we talked about self-starting, it can start in any state. It needs to get back to the proper state. Here, what we assume is something externally says you start in state, whatever, zero, 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 zero. Um, and there's one output, which is the release. So for this simple one, as soon as you get a dollar twenty-five, there's just one candy you get. There's no choice. You better like it. Um, and when you're doing this, there's a few options for how you can make a dollar twenty-five. You put a loony you'd put, and a quarter. You put a quarter first, then a loony. Um, you put five quarters in a row, and you could put two loonies. This thing doesn't give you change, so it'll accept that, but just give you the same stuff. Um, so step two is basically brainstorming to draw what might be an initial diagram. So here what I might say is we have the starting state. Um, and for example, if we had the quarter input is equal to one, we'd move to this state. And then if the loony input is equal to one, we move to that state. And then you release in that state. Or if the loony input is equal to one, we go to this state, and then the quarter input is equal to one. Um, what I haven't shown is every other input. So for example, we stay in this state if there's no input. So if Q is equal to zero and L is equal to zero. Um, and same thing, we stay in this state if there's no change. Likewise, you could have, and I'll just draw these. Um, likewise, we could have this where the loony input or the quarter input is equal to one and then each time it's advancing through. So here I have a specific state for each possible uh, input combination. And that might be sort of an initial way you think about it. Well, I could just do enumerate all the possibilities and have states that move between them. Um, but this isn't quite ideal because A, we have a lot of states, and B, it's still missing some stuff. Like if you put three quarters and then a loony in, uh, you're overpaying, but it should just still open the doors. And this isn't covered here. So a better way to do it is to consider each state a certain amount of money. So you can say a state is you have 25 cents, a state is you have 50 cents, a state is you have 75 cents, a state is you have a dollar or a dollar 25, at which point it opens. And then all you do is, um, for this I'm going to use the notation that we have 
quarter loony. So if you start here, um, you have a quarter in and the loony input zero. In this I always assume only one is high at a time. Both can't be high. Um, so this is sort of a more formal state diagram because I'm showing all of the inputs. And again, if you just put a quarter in, you just advance up between each of these states. Um, likewise, what we can add is the ability to jump. So if we start here and you put a loony in, we move to this state. So if the loony inputs high, again, I have this notation that it goes quarter loony, we go straight to the dollar state. Um, and if you overpay, it always just jumps to that state. So anything beyond this, when you put a loony in, you can say it'll jump to this state. So again, if you put a loony in, it's going to jump. Same here. So it gets a little messy. Um, so in this way, we're covering all the possibilities. No matter how someone pays, it's going to go straight to the dollar twenty-five state. At which point, it'll open. Um, and this sort of representation makes a little more sense and reduces the number of states. So we'll reduce the complexity. And again, if you do nothing, then we have these zero zeros. And you might then add, for example, no matter what, after it does this, we go back to the start and are ready again. Um, so that's a better minimized state diagram of the original problem description. So from this, we move to the symbolic state table. So the symbolic state table is saying the state name and how it moves to the next one. So it's a little small, I know, but for example, this state is all of the zero. This state's all of the 25 cents. This state's the 50 cent state. 75 cent state. Dollar state. And dollar 25 state. Um, so all this is saying is, for example, if you're in the zero cent state, you put in a quarter, you move to the 25 cent state. Um, if you're in the 50 cent state, you put in a quarter, you move to the 75 cent state, or if you put in a dollar, dollar 25 cent state, um, or if you do nothing, you just stay in the same state. So this is now written out in the symbolic state table format. Um, I've also included the state of the release mechanism. So we can see here it goes... It's always zero. It's just one for the final state. Um, step four, we're now going to perform state assignment. So this starts to look a little bit like the counter problems. So we'll say, for example, the 50 cent state is represented by binary 0, 1, 0, um, 25 cent state 0, 0, 1, et cetera. So we've assigned a binary number to each state. Um, you can imagine it's now going to advance through each of these possible states, just like the counter would. The difference between the counter is that we have some um, additional input. So with the counter, it always just advanced. Every clock was advancing. With the state machine, how it changes state depends on the current inputs, too. We then rewrite that exact same table. Now I've rewritten it with these binary um, states inputted. So again, this is still the same thing. This is still the zero cent state, 25 cent state, 50 cent state, 75 cent state, dollar state, and dollar 25. Um, except I'm representing them with binary. So what we have here is the present state is 000, 001. So we can then use this um, in the same design process of the counter stuff. As in the counter, we'll choose the flip-flops we use. So in the same way, what we have is we have the current state, for example, if we're in the 001 state, and we need to move to some new state, say 0, 
um, zero, 1, 0 state. So when we do this design, what we'll have to do is we'll have to design the input for the flip-flop that will move to that state. So we'll have a clock, and then we'll have some inputs, maybe one, maybe two. Um, and we'll make a big table to design that. In the choice of flip-flops, typically we'll either just use D flip-flops or JK. JK result in simpler logic, um, less logic. However, the D flip-flops will simplify the design considerably, and I'll show you an example of that. Um, so here's an example with the D flip-flops. What I've said is that if we're in, you know, state 001 here, um, the next state is 001, because quarter and Looney are both unasserted. To generate state 001 for the D flip-flop, all you do is the D flip-flop inputs are just the next state you want, so 001. Um, so you can see this is pretty simple to design because the D flip-flop inputs and the next state are the same thing. So it's very quick to make this table. Um, I mean, you effectively don't have to make this table because you know the inputs are the next state. And when you look at, for example, zoom in here, um, you see this because here's the state transition table for the D flip-flop. So if we want to move you know, to the one state, the input's just one. The zero state, the input's just zero. Um, so these are always the same. So when you're doing the design, uh, this is why D flip-flop simplify the design, is you just copy the next state here. And if we have a don't care, we just don't care what the input is. Um, with the JK flip-flop, you have to use this, you'll have two inputs to it, so we then have uh, six columns here, for example. And you have to consult the state transition table to decide what each of these inputs are. For example, if we're in state zero, to move to state zero, um, J is zero and K is a don't care. So you have to go through this. So this is just to generate this. And the same for each of these additional ones. For example, here, if we're in state 0 and we want to move to state 1, again, you go to this transition table and you see it's J is 1, K is don't care. And the rest of them are staying the same. So the logic will be simplified because you'll notice there ends up being quite a few don't cares um, in the resulting table. But the downside is before we had to have three sets of logic, one for each of the D flip-flop entries. Now we have six. Uh, logic design processes to go through because we have to design the logic for the J input of the A state flip-flop, the K input of the A state flip-flop, the J input of the B state, etc. Um, so it's somewhat more complicated and to go from 0 to 1, 1 question mark. And if we don't care, we just don't care at all. Um, so you can see how JK flip-flops result in a longer design process. Step six is we use K-maps, um, just like the counter design. We have some flip-flop inputs, flip-flops, and we need to design this input logic. So if we have a flip-flop, and we need to design this input logic. The input logic depends um, both on the flip-flop state, so the state of the finite state machine, and the current input. So we can draw this a little better. Um, so if we have state, and this is the flip-flops, uh, we have some sort of logic. So this is just combinational logic, that is to say AND gates, and OR gates, and OR gates, and stuff like that. Um, and the logic decides or tells the flip-flops what the next state should be. So that goes there. The output state is fed back to this logic. Um, and the logic also receives any inputs to the system. We'll have some output logic as well. And this decides what the outputs will be. And again, this typically depends on the state of the current 
um, stuff. So we'll sort of describe this a little later in how we deal with the open logic. So you can see with the K-maps, what we're doing is designing this logic here and this logic here. Um, and once we have that, that's effectively the complete state machine. So it should be apparent that there's going to be a lot of ways to encode the state and even what flip-flop we use. So for example, I just arbitrarily picked um, these representations to say that the 0 cent was 000, zero, zero and that the 25 cent was 001. Zero, zero, Depending on how you encode it, um, it's obviously going to affect your logic because we'll have different entries in the K map because when we need to go from one state to the next, it's going to mean we need different inputs to the flip flop and everything will totally change. So even for this simple example, you can figure out there's going to be easily a few hundred different ways of encoding this same stuff. Um, so it's unlikely that you're just going to happen to choose the best way of doing it. In real life, we'll use design tools. So we'll design what the states we want are, and it'll pick all of this, um, which we'll talk about a tiny bit. Some design tools we'll talk about a little bit tomorrow. Um, but for now, we'll do this all manually. So here's an example. Design a simple stoplight. Um, so a stoplight, there's two pairs, one north-south, one east-west. And the pattern, so we have something like that, an intersection. Um, it goes green for 10 seconds. It's then yellow for one second and red for one second. And there's one second overlap, so it's red for both directions for that one second. Um, you can assume that you have a one hertz clock available to simplify things, and you know it, externally it deals with reset if required. But once it's running, it should just run through all of them. So here's sort of what the end result should look like. So you can see it goes green for a while. And then it should go yellow um, for a second for red. And then the next set goes. So it goes green for a while, 10-ish um, seconds. And then it'll go yellow, then red. And then the top direction will go again. So that's all handled by a simple state machine. So we'll go through the design process of this exact one. So understand the problem. At this point, you can sort of start to think about what do we have available and what do we need. Um, so we have to drive some lights, you can say. We have to generate this block here. We have some clock input and maybe reset. Um, and within here, we have to have the finite state machine, FSM. So the next step is we might draw an initial state diagram. Um, at this point, again, you can sort of brainstorm different ways to do it to figure out what's the minimalist. So one of the initial thoughts might be as well, we could have um, a state for sort of everything that's needed. So we could start here. And then we go red. Again, we have a one hertz clock, so every second something is going to change, which would mean if we want that 10 second delay, we could do, you know, we could do 10 green states. So green one, green two, green three, and it just advances through them. And this would work, um, but it's obviously going to end up with quite a few states because then we have to repeat this for the other direction. So that's not ideal. So what we need is we need to actually add some input. Um, so when we had this, what we're going to do is inside sort of our logic, but outside the finite state machine, we'll design a counter.
Um, so we have this counter here that'll count clock pulses, and we'll use this to time stuff. So it's controlled by this one hertz clock as well. Um, and the finite state machine will need to reset the counter. So it'll count up to some number, and the finite state machine will say, OK, turn back to 0 and start timing the game. So if we have something like this, we can draw a bit of a simplified diagram, because we now have the ability to measure how long we're in a specific state for. Um, driving me crazy. I don't know why. Okay, but what we will then do is have a minimalized state diagram where we'll have only the states red, yellow, red, green, yellow for north, south, and then red, green, yellow for east, west. When we're in the green state, we have the ability to time to say, okay, stay in that state for however many seconds. So if we go down to this, um, we could draw it, for example, we can start with red, and again, all directions red. Green. So this is north south, yellow north south. Um, red, and then it'll go green in the other direction, east west, yellow east west, and then back to red. So you have to figure out how to work in. Um, that counter input into this. And what we'll have is that we assume in these two red states, say I'll stir them, um, we reset that external counter. So in the red state, we reset counter, so that's one of the outputs we're talking about. And we'll have this additional um, control here, and we'll say green only moves out if count is, you know, equal to 10. If count is not equal to 10, it stays in the green state. Um, the other states don't check the counter. They just advance because they're only one second long. Um, same thing here. We'll say if you know, count is not equal to 10, we stay in the green state. If count is equal to 10, we move out of the green state. So this is a much smaller state diagram because we only have the six states now. We have ha added this extra input, so we've added this extra counter where the counter um, controls moving out of the green state. We don't use the inputs in the other states, you notice. So the next step is to draw the state transition table. Um, I've also skipped, you would assign the state, so here you can see I've just assigned, for example, 000 is the first red state, 001 is the green state, 010 is the yellow state, 011 is the next red state. Um, and then I put 101 as the next green state and 110 as the next yellow state. So to generate those two lower states, all I did is added a 1 in front of the upper state numbers. So from this, we can generate the, um, the complete state transition diagram, because we can say if we're in that first red state, we always move to the green state. You don't care what the count input is. Um, if we're in the green state, we only move out when count is 1. Otherwise, we stay in the green state. Likewise, for the second green state, the exact same thing. So you only move out if count um, is equal to 1. So this is then the state transition table. So it's saying when we start, you know, in the 000, we move to this state, 001, et cetera. So from this, we can do the design where we'll use D flip-flops again, um, because with D flip-flops, the input to the flip-flop is just the required next state. Um, as I said, for design convenience, we do that, and then we implement it. So this is showing you, for example, the A state. So what I've done is, um, this is crazy. 
is I've taken that state transition table that has ABC. So the ABC are the current states. D is one of the other inputs. Um, and then I've drawn that on just a K map for the A plus, um, where A plus is the required output. Um, so, for example, we, we've just taken this um, section here. So for that K-map, I've just taken this. Where these first four columns are the inputs, and you can see that they're written down as the A, B, C, D, and this next column is the required output. Um, in the same way, we'll do that for the B plus and the C plus. So for B plus, the outputs will become just this column. And for the C K map, the output is just that column. So the input's always the same for, and the output depends on what we're designing. Um, a quick note here. What I've done is I've actually, in the state transition table, you might have noticed not every possible state was used. There was a bunch of don't care states. Um, to simplify, I didn't write down every possible input state and every possible output state. Um, I just left some of them out. So you can take a bit of a design shortcut if you do it that way, because when you write the K-map, you can write all of the zeros and all the ones. Normally, we just write the ones. Everything that's left is a don't care, because it's something that you didn't specify um, and you assume is a don't care. So in that case, we can, for example, fill in this with these question marks indicating the don't care states. Um, obviously, once we have this, we can then generate the logic. So this is saying for the D flip-flop, um, the input to the D flip-flop is the current state of B ended with the state of C or with A and C. Um, so again, you can do the same thing for the B flip-flop, and I'm doing the same process here where I take that truth table and I fill in the whole K-map with everything given, and whatever is not specified will become don't cares. Um, and again, those don't cares might be used to simplify, in this case they weren't, uh, the design by expanding the K-map. For the C state, exact same thing, I take those inputs, A, B, C, D, um, where D is the counter value, and I write them here. These blanks are don't cares. Um, in this case, actually, again, we don't even use the don't cares to simplify things, and we have this logic. So for the C input, um, the outputs become, for the C state, sorry, the inputs to the flip-flop becomes this. Um, you can then write out each of the required implementations, so A, B, C, and then implement it. Um, this will only deal with the state transition, so moving from you know the green state to the yellow state and the red state, blah, blah, blah. It's not actually doing anything with the lights. There's still nothing happening. Um, so now what we're going to do is the output map. So the output map, we have just the state here, ABC, um, and we have the different outputs. So we have the red, um, light, the yellow light, and the green light, and we have this for each direction. So this is, for example, north-south. This is east-west. We also said before we would have this counter that's counting how many seconds we've been in a state. Um, and we need a reset line for that because we want it to count to 10, and then later we want to reset it. Uh, it's not just counting to 10 continually because the problem is uh, we need it to count to 10 starting at that green state. So we also have this reset out. So this is to the counter. Um, and you can see what I've done here is in the red state, it just gets reset. Uh, you could alternatively make these yellows don't care um, because it'll get reset eventually. So sort of up to you. I've also showed the two invalid states as being... Um, 
we don't know what they are, but I'm explicitly specifying the output as, for example, in the don't care states as read both ways. Um, this is, in real life, this is where you can get into trouble because, for example, if you don't specify this, and with a real traffic controller, you just leave them as don't care. You know, maybe it maps that in that don't care uh, state, it's green both ways, or it's all the lights are on, or something nonsensical. Um, and if due to some error, in fact, gets into one of those states, obviously what it's controlling, uh, something bad could happen because you haven't specified the outputs, it gets into this don't care, and the lights go green both ways, and there's an accident. Um, so here I've explicitly specified that those don't care states, it's just read both ways to make it as safe as possible. And again, we can um, use a K-map for each of these outputs. So each of these single outputs, we have uh, three input variables and one output variable. So one output variable is red, north, south, yellow, north, south, green, north, south, you know, red, east, west, yellow, east, west, green, east, west and the reset line to the controller. So in total, we'll have seven K-maps to do for this. Um, and this is what they look like. You'll notice that the, the yellow and green, there's only a single one, so you're only going to end up with that single term. Um, and the red, you expect to be high in all except two spots. So, for example, north, south, red will always be red, except for when that light's yellow and green, which is only two of the other states. Um, and again, we can simplify. You get these expressions here. Um, exact same thing on the east-west side. We get similar idea. So it's going to be output high for only a specific state for yellow and green. Um, output high for most of the states for red. And the reset line, I had just specifically said, okay, reset only when we're in the red states. Um, as we mentioned, you could change this, so you could reset at other times if you wanted, adjust the code. It's up to you. This is probably not the most ideal because we see we just have two terms all by themselves, so you might be able to simplify a little. Finally, the implementation. So this is showing in the um, ISC software. We've, I've drawn a schematic of those previous terms. So you can see it gets fairly complicated because we have a lot of gates um, packed in here. And this is just for very small, like those six states. Uh, again, using D flip-flops, if you use JK, you expect to see less of this logic around. Um, a note in this diagram, and there should be a high resolution version of it. In this diagram, I haven't drawn wires for everything um, because it would get so messy. So what I've done is labeled the pins and all of pins with the same net name are connected together. So for example, we have B here, B here, B here, B here, and B here. Um, Physically, those are as if I drew a wire connected like this. So the electrical connection is the same, except you don't have the wire going everywhere. Um, and just a note, if you want to do the same sort of thing in the ISE software, um, how you do it, I'll just show you, as it could be useful for um, your stuff. Um, only because it can greatly simplify your connection. So if I open my schematic here, um, one of the advantages is you probably notice with ISE, if you want to change something, if you click a wire, it clicks the whole thing and you have to delete it and redraw it. Um, with this, if say I screwed up and said, oh, that should be connected to B, you can just rename it, you know, B, and you're done. Um, and it's now connected to B. So to show you, I'll just start a new schematic here. You just drop a symbol down. Um, this is showed in the slides too, so it's written down. So say if you have this symbol, you have to draw very short wires. 
Um, so you get those red boxes. Um, and then you have to add a name to them. So you can do this by clicking on it. And you have to click on the wire. This isn't working, for example. You have to click on the wire. Rename selected net should come up. Um, and it gives you the ability to give it a name here. So it defaults to some generic-ish name. And you can just name it, you know, Y. Oops, did that work? Um, and if it's not connected to anything else, it'll still have that little circly thing, or that. So I'm just going to name this A, B, um, and then those will connect to anything else named A, B, C, for example. So I could put down another gate. And for example, you could connect the output of this gate to the input of that gate. Um, name it Y. And it, when it's connecting two together, it'll tell you that the name already exists. Do you want to merge them? So you say yes, because it's just telling you that, hey, you're connecting this to that. Uh, and that's fine. So for example, to connect this to the B net, again, we just go rename B. Um, one note is that if, say, you later want to connect this B line to C. Um, you have two options. You either it'll say rename the branches net or rename the branch. Renaming the branch is just renaming this little leg here, which is what you want. So if I do this, it disconnects B and connects it to C. Um, if you accidentally select the other option, what it's going to do, it's going to globally rename everything that's B to C. So for example, if I select the top one, which is probably not what you want most of the time, you can notice that both of those, so the B down here also changed to C because it globally changed the whole name of the B net to C and connected them together. Um, so that's how you can do similar stuff with ISE. So there's a few, there's two main types of state machines we'll talk about, too. In the one shown, I had this $25 state. In the $25 state, um, it was opening the release mechanism. So the output depended only on the current state. As long as it was in the $25 state, the release mechanism opened, and that was it. Alternatively, I could have written the state diagram like this. Here you see I've eliminated that $25 state. We only go up to the dollar state. Um, but the output depends on the input. So if we're in the dollar state and you put in a quarter, you can see the output goes high, this line here, and then we just move to the zero state. We don't even need the $25 state. And you can see that anywhere that we previously went to the $25 state, um, I've just said, now just open the, op open the release and move to the zero state. Um, the difference is now that you can see within each state, the release mechanism doesn't depend solely on the state. So in this dollar state, sometimes it opens, sometimes it doesn't. You know, in the same in the dollar 25 state. Um, the status of the release mechanism depends on both the current state so if we're in the 25 cent state and you put in a quarter, it doesn't open. And the inputs. Um, and you can see that in this table here. We give these two names. So mealy machine is what I just described, where the output depends on the state and the current inputs. Um, so this is sort of a simple state transition diagram showing you that for each transition, um, 
the transition is caused by a certain input, which is before the slash here in red. And that transition, uh, which comes from the same state, you know, here we have this SI, may have different outputs, um, depending on what the inputs are. So in this state transition diagram, I'm showing both outputs and inputs on the uh, diagram, making it a mealing machine. So the output changes per transition. Um, in a more machine, what we have is that you can see I've just written the outputs in the states. The output depends only on the current states. If I'm in this S0 state, the output's always zero. Likewise, when I was in the dollar twenty-five state, the output is always on, always release, otherwise zero. Um, so in this case, you move between states, still depends on the inputs, exact same way as before, but the output depends only on state. Um, so to give you an example, a while back I had showed you this, this simple design example. I have a lamp, it has an on and off push button. Um, so the buttons are only momentary, meaning I need state to know if I'm in the off state, hit the off button, it does nothing, but if I'm in the on state, hit the off button, it goes off and stays off. Um, I also want to add a buzzer that beeps every time, every time it changes only. Uh, not when you press the button, only when the state changes. So we can go through the same steps, okay, what, what do you need to understand? Well, we need to understand there's some buttons on button, there's an off button, there's a state machine, and there's a lamp. And I've also added ground, a buzzer. So we have some, assume you just go high to turn it on. So this is buzzer and this is lamp. And we have the on and off push buttons. Um, so we want to move between the on and off states. So that's pretty simple. We can just draw the state transition diagram. Say, for example, we have the off state or you have the on state. And you're going to move between them every time. Um, oops, that's wrong. Should go back to that. Every time we have some input changes. So we can draw that a little more formally. Um, starting with the mealy machine. So with the, uh, the design example of the mealy machine, the output depends on the input and the state. So for example, in the on state, I'm just going to have the lamp on. In the off state, I'm going to have the lamp off. After the slash here, what I've showed is the buzzer state. Um, and again, this is the inputs. So with the mealing machine, I still have these just two states. I have the on state and the off state. Um, in the on state, if you press the on button, it does nothing. And if you do nothing, it just stays in the on state. So that's what this is showing. Um, if you're in the on state and you press the off button, as expected, we move to the off state. Uh, we also activate the buzzer, though, during that transition. So you can see what I've done is I've added this slash one to say buzzer is on. Once we get to this off state, um, the buzzer will always turn off because now it's staying in the same state. So you can see that the output of the buzzer um, depends on the current state and the outputs. If, you're, if you press the on button, the buzzer only goes if you're already in the off state. It's not always when you press a button, the buzzer goes. Using what we were previously doing with the more machine, would look something like this, because the state, the outputs depend solely on the state. So what we need to do is add these additional states to say, here, we go from on, we beep, and then we go off. And off, we go beep, and then on. Um, because we need this intermediate state to control the buzzer, because only in those two states is the buzzer on, and then it moves onward. Um, so you can see the more state machine typically will have more states um, to it compared to the mealy machine. Uh, it 
depending on your design, uh, one may be less complicated than the other. So in the example given here, I don't think I go through. Yeah. So in the example given here, the Mealy machine, there's only one bit to hold the state. It's either zero or one. So that's going to be quite simple because we'll have just one flip-flop needed, you can imagine, because it's only a single bit. Um, so for example, if we're in the initial state of zero, you do nothing, you go zero, um, and the lamp, in this case, we're going to say the lamp is always zero when we're in this state, and it's always one when we're in that state. Um, so even though the lamp output depends only on the state, it's the buzzer output that will change. So in this case, we say zero, go one. So you can see the buzzer is going whenever we change. Um, likewise, if we're already on, you do nothing. We just stay on. If we're on, we go off. And then if they're both asserted at the same time, um, we could either put it a question mark, or maybe we just say, well, we'll just stay in the exact same state. If you press them both at the same time, it does nothing. And again, the buzzer output depends on if there's a transition or not, we're saying. So the output's one um, only in these certain circumstances. For the more machine, we had four states. Um, so this means we'll actually need two bits in the state. Uh, so what you can see is that the logic will be slightly more complicated because now um, we actually have four input variables when you do this because when you're designing the state transition logic, we have two bits of state, an input, an on button, and an off button. With the mealing machine, um, there's only three bits, so in the KMAP, it's only you know the smaller KMAP you'll be using because what the next state depends on is only these three things. So the logic dictating how the states change will become simpler in this example. Uh, the logic dictating the output will be a tiny bit more complicated because for the buzzer, for example, it's dependent on the state and inputs. With the more machine, the buzzer is going to be solely dependent on the state, so it's you know only ever going to be there. So the output logic for the buzzer, for the more machine, in this case, would just be a comparison. Are we in this state, or are we in this state, and that's it. So it would just be uh, two AND terms that are all together. But the downside is that all the rest of your logic is now a lot more complicated. So in this example, the mealing machine would make considerably more sense. Um, Depending on how the problem's formulated, it might not make a difference, basically. Um, if your output's not really dependent on the current inputs, then there's no real advantage to formulating it one way or the other always. When we see a more machine, and ignore the function of this, it doesn't make any sense, we can see, for example, we have two outputs here, x and y. Uh, one output x is you know this Q complement and the Y output is dependent solely on the current state because you see we have the output of the flip flop there and another output there. When you have a mealy machine, um, you'll frequently have see it designed with asynchronous output, which is to say that okay we have one output here going to X um, and the Y is actually coming. You can see through this and directly from the A input. So as soon as the A input changes, the Y output can change, which is why we call it asynchronous, because it's not changing with the clock. The X output will only change every time there's a clock pulse, because when we have a clock pulse, we know that the, this SR flip-flop I'm using here um, will sample the inputs and you know, do the expected transition. And at that point, the X output will change. But the Y output in this design changes every time the A input changes, regardless of the clock. You can design a mealy machine uh, with synchronous outputs. That is to say, it changes with the clock. 
Um, so in this example, what I've done is we actually have this registered input here. So the input, which can change arbitrarily, um, is only presented to the circuit on this rising edge of the clock. And then the circuit acts upon it. So well, with a Mealy machine, we'll often have asynchronous outputs. That is to say, as soon as the input changes, the output can change. It's not a requirement of it. So you can't just look at that to decide if you have a Mealy or more. How you decide is you simply look at, does one of the outputs depend solely on the current state? If so, it's more. Um, if it depends on the input as well, so in this example, you can see there's this input line. Then you have a Mealy machine. Final note here is that we had this idea when we were talking before, when I picked my states, I had just sort of arbitrarily picked, okay, here's one, here's the next one, here's the next one. Um, and this was what looked like a binary encoding. So you can see I encoded this as binary zero, the next state is binary one, the next state is binary two, the next state is binary three. Um, this is pretty easy for design purposes because it makes sense. You can directly look at that and say that's state zero, that's state one, that's state two, that's state three. Which is the advantage of binary encoding is that for the design purpose it's easy um, and fairly quick and makes sense. It's not always the best choice depending what you want. Um, another option we'll see is what's called one hot encoding. In one hot encoding one of the bits is always one. So you can see here, one bit is always one. And when we move states, we just move between which bit is one. So you need as many bits as you have states. Um, so with binary encoding, for example, you know, to have 16 states, you could do that in four bits. With one hot encoding, you would need 16 bits, which is a lot more complicated to design with. Um, with the tools we're using, anyway. The advantage of one hot is that it's much, much faster um, because each state is a single bit. What you see is, for example, you know, if you have, oops, say if I had these different states and, you know, I have some output logic and some input logic. With binary encoding, we had to, you know, we had this logic to look at, okay, what is the current state? We have to compare it to so state four and then figure out what do we do with it. With one hot, what you see is directly, you know, this is state one, two, three, four, so your logic can just say, I am in state four. Um, and you can have the logic doing whatever you need for state four. And maybe you or that with, you know, something else. Um, and this makes it considerably faster in implementation, so it runs at higher speeds. And that's the primary advantage of one-hot encoding. Or the absolute main advantage, actually, is the higher speeds you can achieve. So the logic itself can run much faster with one-hot. Um, finally, you might see gray encoding used. Um, so as you hopefully remember, gray encoding is a scheme where each change differs only by a single bit. Um, so in this state, when I'm going from 0, 0 to the next state, 0, 1, only this bit changes from a 0 to a 1. Um, in the same way, when I go from the 0, 1 state to the 1, 1 state, you know, with binary, we count 1, 0, which would be two bit transitions, because when we go from 1, 0, or sorry, 0, 1, to one zero, um, each of the bits is flipping. So this bit changes from a zero, from a one to a zero, and this bit changes from a zero to a one. Uh, and the problem is that when that happens, it's not going to happen at exactly the same time. So if you look at over time, for example, if this is bit one, bit zero. Um, if this is bit one here. So bit one is going from zero to one. 
and bit one goes from one to zero. Um, so in reality, there's going to be some delay between them. And in that intermediate time, what's actually happened is that it's equal to some nonsensical or some in intermediate value, which you didn't want it. So here it's actually equal to 1, 1. So it was equal to 0, 1 here, and then 1, 0. Um, and there's this glitch where it's equal to 1, 1. For the stuff we've been talking about for now, this doesn't really matter because we had this clock pulse. So at the clock pulse, we sample it. Um, this intermediate stuff would happen before the next clock pulse. So it, the clock pulse happens, the state changes, there's some intermediate crap, we don't care about it because by the time you have the next clock pulse, it's settled down. Where we use gray encoding is if you had some logic that was dependent, um, combinational logic, so it's dependent, it's always checking the current state. It doesn't have that clock. Um, so, you know, the output logic is always checking the current state and changes based solely on the current state. Um, and what you might have is then, for example, if your output logic is designed such that when the current state is 1, 1, you know, it goes high, during this transition, it'll unintendedly go high. Um, so you may use gray encoding if that's an issue because with gray encoding, only a single bit changes at a time between the states. Um, so it's impossible to have this condition where there's an invalid bit because only one bit's changing, so there's no sort of race between who, which bit gets there first and which changes first. Um, so in this example, we go from 0, 1 to 1, 1. The 0 becomes a 1, and then here we go to 1, 0. Um, and it may just be there's only a certain state transitions you care about because, for example, only in a certain state does the output become one. Um, so in this example, every state transition would respect the grain coding because we go from zero, zero to zero, one. Um, we go from zero, one to one, one. And we go from 1, 1 to 1, 0, and 1, 0, 0, 0. So that's where the gray encoding is seen, in that the transitions are always one bit different. Um, for example, even though, you know, it looks like I've encoded the, the state sequentially in gray encoding, if you had something like, well, at this point, I need to jump straight to the 0, 0 state, um, you know, this transition there would not be gray encoding because two bits are changing. Uh, so what you can imagine in the state machine that might be there's only certain changes you care about ensuring are um, a single bit changes at a time. In which case, you know, you might have to adjust the encoding, encoding of how the state machine's working to keep the gray encoding scheme. Um, so this is, you know, if you have, if all you have is a state machine that looks something like that with conditions on when it changes, that's fine because that's easy to do. But if you have a state machine that might jump, you know, if you have something like this, um, and depending on the inputs, you may jump, obviously from here, to here, actually, let me. So from this first state to the second state, um, that could be, you know, gray encoding. That could be only a single bit changes. Or um, from this first state to this third state could be gray encoding. But you obviously you can't have both. Because if only a single bit's changing, there's only one uh, possibility for what that is. So it's also may not be applicable to every design. And again, it's really important only when the output, you can't have those glitches on it. So that's an introduction to the finite state machine stuff. Um, I'll just go over a quick review.
So the general process that I've tried to show through a few examples is these six steps. So understanding the problem, which is just sort of reading it, thinking about how it might work. Drawing the initial state diagram, which will probably be wrong, but this is more or less brainstorming, thinking about how can I move between different states. Um, and in step three, that's where you want to get the minimized one. So this might involve combining states, thinking about ways of using external logic to figure out, okay, instead of having 30 states, I'm going to have a count that counts to 30. You perform the state assignment, um, which is to say state one is 100, zero zero, state two is 101, zero one, or whatever you're using. Uh, frequently, we'll just use binary, so the first state is 000, zero zero, the next state is 001, zero zero et cetera. Um, and with that, you can draw the street, the state transition table, which is to say if you're in state 000, zero zero, the input's one, you move to state 100, zero zero, whatever. Um, for choosing the flip flops, Generally, we'll use D flip-flops because it's easier to um, sort of understand the design with. And then you implement it. So implementing it means taking the state transition table and generating the logic from that for the D flip-flops, uh, normally using K maps. So I had an example here. There's a few more examples in the class notes, too, if you want, um, working through using different types of flip-flops and whatnot. So the vending machine idea, understanding the problem, was saying, okay, we have loonies and we have quarters. Um, and maybe some of the different sequences you might use. So, you know, you could have these different ways of getting the dollar twenty-five. There's no change given. So we have two loonies, for example, and that's fine. You just don't get anything back. You get candy. Um, I had this initial diagram where I sort of drew out all the possible transitions. Which you then say, well, that's too complicated. So the minimized diagram is to think that an easier way to do it is to look at each state as a amount of money. Um, and you just, if you put a quarter in, you transition through them. And you can jump, for example, by putting loonies in to different states. So if you put a dollar in, you go to the dollar state. The symbolic table is showing all of those transitions. So it's showing you, if I'm in the 25 cent state, for example, the quarter input is one, the loony input is zero, I then move to the 50 cent state. If I'm in the 50 cent state, the loony input, or the quarter input is zero, the loony input is one, I move to the dollar 25 state. So you just fill in this whole table showing every possible transition. And ones you either don't care about or invalid, um, you can just put as don't care. So they are shown with question marks. So for example, I know I will never get 1-1 one, one as an input. I know, you know the, the logic driving this only has quarter, only has dollar. It's designed to never give me 1-1. One, one. So I put question marks, which later might simplify the design process a little. As I said, state assignment, I just arbitrarily assign them here. And then the straight transition table is the exact same thing, except instead of the nice names, I have the binary numbers here. Um, as I said, you can use D flip-flops, which simplify the design. They simplify the design oops, um, because the next, the, the input to the D flip-flops is the same thing as the next state. So, you know, this just becomes that. Um, because whatever next state we want, we just feed that number in and you're done. JK flip-flops will tend to result in simpler logic, um, but it's more complicated to design with because we now have two inputs to each of the flip-flops. So one flip-flop stores one bit of the state. And those inputs, you typically would go to, you know, this state transition table. So I'd say, okay, to go from zero to zero, zero question mark and so forth. Or for this example, to go from the 001 state to the 101, so bit, this bit goes from 0 to 1. So to go from 0 to 1, it is 1, whatever. Um, for this bit, to go from 0 to 0, we know is 0 question mark. And to go from 1 
to 1, um, question mark 0. So again, you fill in this whole table, and then for each of those outputs, you'll have to do k-mapping techniques. Um, and when we're obviously de uh, deciding what the states are representing, so you know, I could have chosen that 25 cents is represented by 111 and 50 cents is represented by 000. I more or less did that arbitrarily. Um, depending on how your states move between them, there's going to be some methods that are a lot more efficient than others. And the design process, there's no manual way to do that easily. It's brute force is sort of what you'd be left with. Um, I will more or less do this on a computer in any larger approaching real state diagram. So as a design example, I had this simple stoplight, um, which you can implement on the board there. And this stoplight is like a real stoplight. It is green in one direction and red in all the others. Um, and then goes yellow, red in both directions, then green in the other direction, etc. Um, in the design example, you know, the initial state diagram, you might say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to count through every possible state, which includes green for one second, green for two seconds, green for three seconds, green for four seconds, green for five seconds. And each of those is a different state, and I just count through it, which would work, but um, you're going to have a ton of states. So an easier minimized diagram, you might say I'm going to have red, green, yellow, and north-south. It's all north-south. And then I'm going to do the same thing in east-west. And what I'm going to use is a counter to count how long I'm in the state. Um, and I'm going to transition out of green only when you know I've been in green for 10 seconds. Otherwise, I stay in the same state. And for the rest of the states, they always just change. So it's always going to change after one second. Um, so then you'll have this minimized state diagram like that. Because I have a counter, what that means is there's going to be some external control logic, we said. So in the red states, I'm going to reset that counter so that once it goes into the green states, it's counting up to 10. Um, again, we have a state transition table where ABC is the current states. Um, and then we have this counter input. And the counter input, I've externally added a comparator so that it goes high whenever the counter is equal to 10. Um, so if counter is equal to 10, the input's high. So we can see, for example, all the states don't really care about it except the green state, where depending on the value of the counter, um, it affects whether we stay in the green state or we move to the next state. So if the counter output's 1, we then move to the next state, the yellow state. From the state transition table, um, you can implement, so for example, we'll take this as one design problem where A, B, C are the inputs, so we'll have four inputs, and then A is the output. Uh, and we'll do the same thing for B being the output and C being the output. So we'll have three big K maps. Um, showing the A plus, so this is the input to the A flip-flop, B plus, which is the same thing as the input to the B flip-flop, because we're using D flip-flops, and C plus, again, we're using D flip-flops, so this is the input to the C state flip-flop. And then you get all of the equations. We'll have a bunch of outputs. We have seven outputs, because six LEDs plus the reset to the counter um, and in the same way, we'll have seven K flip-flops. Uh, the output depends only on the current state with these. Um, therefore, there's only the three, the ABC, or the three states. And you can design the whole thing, simulate it or implement it. Um, I had mentioned there, in this example, where the output depends only on the state. So based solely on the state, 
you know what the output is. This is what we call a more machine. Um, another option is a mealy machine, where the output depends on the states and the current inputs. Um, the advantage is that you may have less state transitions with a mealy machine. So in this example of a lamp, where I want it to buzz every time the state changes, to do it with a mealy machine, um, I can have the output be dependent on the input. So as well as the current state. So if the input's on, if the state is on, and you press the on input, it does not buzz. If the input's on, and you press the off button, it does buzz. If the current state is off, um, and you press the off button, it doesn't buzz anymore. So previously, when we were in the on state, and you did this, the output was um, 1, but now the output's 0 for the buzzer. So to do this same type of thing with a more machine where we have individual states that we move between, we would need two extra states, these beep states. So with the beep state, you can see we're on, we transition to beep, and then we go off. So we've added an extra state, which will complicate the design process. So for the more machine with the extra state, we now have two bits to hold the state, as well as two inputs. So we now have these four variables we'll be using. Um, with the Mealy machine, you can see we only have three variables. And there's only one output of the next state. So when we're doing the state transition logic, um, you know, we just have this one K-map to do for the state transition logic. And then you do another one for the lamp and another one for the buzzer. With the more, um, the next state will actually be two bits. So therefore, you'll have two uh, four input variable k-maps to do for the next state, and then it came out for the lamp uh, and the buzzer. The lamp and buzzer, because you know it's solely dependent on the state, you can sort of simplify that if you want to. Um, with mealing machines, we'll often have asynchronous outputs, where the outputs change as soon as the inputs change. Um, it's not a requirement. You can make it so that they're synchronous. And basically, the key thing with the Mealy machine is that when you're looking at the schematic, you'll notice that there's this feed through. So the input is somehow connected um, to the output without being dependent solely on the state. When you encode it, as I said before, you can just arbitrarily decide. Um, we may use binary encoding, which is sort of simple, which is to say state 0 is binary 0, state 1 is binary 1, state 2 is 2, 3 is 3. Um, we can use one-hot encoding where we just use a chain of um, flip-flops and you have as many state bits as you have states. So if we have 16 states, you need 16 bits. Um, whereas with binary, if you had 16 states, you'd get away with 4 bits. One-hot encoding is fast. That's the sole huge advantage of it is the implementation will run much faster. With gray coding, um, this is what we do where when we change states, we don't want any intermediate glitches. So we'll use gray coding where we go from, for example, 1, 1 here to the 1, 0 state. So only one bit has changed, meaning if you have combinational logic dependent on your current state, um, there won't be any intermediate glitches. So, you know, you, you'll never have this case where there'll be a very short glitch um, that causes unintended outputs. So, you know, we have the three state bits and we have some combinational logic. If it's changing from, you know, one, one, zero and changing to zero, zero, one, that's almost the worst case, since all three bits are flipping. So it might be that with normal binary encoding, this bit changes, but that's 0 going 1, you know, and this one's a bit delayed, and this one's a bit delayed. So even though the output shouldn't go high in this example, um, it will go high for a very short amount of time because due to the delay, the AND gate is seeing all three 
inputs is high for this little time period here. Um, so with gray coding, we don't have this problem because only one bit changes at a time. So the advantage of gray coding is you don't have those glitches on the output. That's all. So if you want to see more, the 2200 notes, course notes posted, have a bunch of examples, and the textbook also talks a bit about this.